Youth, our Sonic Youth, the band, and uh, Shadow of a Doubt, the name of the video. Christopher Ward here on City Limits, and time for our Inner Limits feature. And uh, we had an opportunity to chat with Mitch Easter, who is, of course, the leader of Let's Active. They just released their most recent LP called Every Dog Has His Day, uh, called by many their best yet. Um, and included in our profile today, we will have uh, Let's Active, an oldie called Waters Part. We'll also have a band called Love Tractor and Party Train, the DBs working for somebody else and some vintage REM, including Radio Free Europe, as well as their brand new one called Orange Crush. And uh, I think probably Mitch first came to prominence as the first producer of REM and the LP Murmur from which uh, Radio Free Europe is taken. Uh, he did the work actually at his own home studio in North Carolina called Mitch Easter's Drive-In. We wandered down the street to chat about some of his favorite bands, friends, and stars and stipes on our Inner Limits feature. The first productions that I was aware that you did were the, uh, the early R.E.M. albums. I wonder if you can look back at that time and what it was like trying to pull all those somewhat disparate personalities together to make an album. Uh, well, the way I first encountered them was that they literally called up to come in and record. I had never seen the band or anything like that. I, I knew they existed. And when they showed up at the house, I realized that their manager is a guy I used to see in clubs because he's from North Carolina and I used to see him out at, at bars and stuff. But it took me a minute to recognize him because at that point he had a shaved head. I'm talking about Jefferson Holt here. And the um, rest of them I'd never seen before, but I remember really clearly thinking that I thought Stipe looked like Ian Hunter and because uh, he had all these specs and he had Ian Hunter hair. And I remember it real well. And they, you know, we, so they spent the night at our house and we sort of just talked and stuff. And the next day I went over to the studio and cut these tracks for what turned out to be the Radio Free Europe single, which a lot of people never heard, but it's now out on that eponymous record. Um, this is a different, this is a different one than what's on Murmur. From right. the Murmur one. And, um, but it came about through mutual friends, you know, and this guy in New York that was a friend of theirs and a friend of mine told them about my studio and they came down to do what was supposed to be a demo tape then it got released. Um, so it was like a one or two day session and we did three songs and, and it was great. And the thing that struck me then was that they were like, um, this will sound funny to people that see them as like a real now band, but I thought they were like a sort of classic 60s combo, you know, like four groovy guys and their groovy songs, you know, I thought it was real likable, you know, and I thought that they had kind of a um, directness about them that was real attractive, and that's exactly the opposite of what everybody says about them, you know, nobody says they're direct or anything, but to me they struck me as a real, you know, like singles band of the 60s or something when they first came in. And we had a good time, and then they ended up coming back and doing some stuff that turned out to be Chronic Town, and then uh, then they got signed to IRS, and IRS released Chronic Town. And then um, when we did Murmur, it was sort of, the beginning of the Murmur session was we went down to Reflection Studio in Charlotte, because it had 24 tracks, which I didn't have then, and we cut um, Pilgrimage. And it was really sort of like an audition for, for the label, because the record company, I think, wanted them to be produced by some guy from Boston who has since gone on to, to big fame and everything, but the band went in and cut some tracks with him and they didn't have a good time at all because he put synthesizers on and stuff, which was a real no, you know. And um, so anyway, when we did our tracks with him, we didn't try to do that. We, we just um, let them do their thing. And the band was a lot happier and I don't think anybody at the record company was exactly sure of which way it should go, but the band really insisted on me and Don Dixon doing it, so that's how we got the job to do Murmur. To their current records, they've gone through a handful of producers since working with you. Does it seem like they've maintained the same original ideals? Well, they've gotten. You know, I think they were sort of actually interested in uh, some of these kind of other sounds. You know, like heavy guitars and stuff instead of the clear guitars, and so you hear more heavy guitars on the new records and things like that. But to me, you know, they they were sort of like born intact. You know, I mean, like some bands sort of develop and on their third album they're finally getting there. You know. These guys just sort of like, you know, appeared and there they were. And I mean, I think they had their REM thing down from the word go. And um, to me, you know, they just sort of evolved in a steady way, but they haven't ever made any abrupt turns or anything. And I've known him, and I've known him since the second grade. So we, he and I go way back, and we've done a lot of musical things together. And I've since worked with him on his own records. Like he's had one that came out on A&M, and he's got a new one underway, and I've played guitar on both those. Um, and then like Holes Apple and Gene Holder and Will Rigby are guys I've known since like junior high and stuff. And you know, I played in a band with uh, Will Rigby and with Peter Holes Apple in, in high school. And, and well, even in college, I played with Peter. So I've known them forever. You know, they, they're from Winston Salem, like us. And actually, the town that I'm from is only like about 150,000 people, but there's a lot of musicians that came out of there. And, Seems like it. And uh, some of them you've heard of, like the DBs, you know, and us. 
Are they get carrying on the same sort of musical traditions that you are? Do you feel? Um, well, I guess it's probably sort of split somewhat over the years, but I think we definitely started in the same place, and we listened to the same unpopular records together, you know, things like The Move and The Flaming Groovies and, you know, this sort of, at the time, hipster music, you know, we all listened to that. And, and I think um, I hear bits in their songwriting that reminds me of things that, you know, bits that I might use to or something, you know. Uh, when I hear Peter's songs now, I don't think they're too much like mine or anything, but I think we did kind of start at point X together, or at least sort of close together. This point, but I remember an earlier Led Zeppelin video, is it Waters Part? Is that... If you've ever seen that one, then you're among the few. Because we did do a video for Waters Part, just on, like, home equipment. And um, it was released. We played it. You did? <laughs> yeah, we did. Well, good for you, because <laughs> I don't think anybody else did. Um, but it was, yeah, we did do one for that song. All we've ever had is we had a segment taken from the Cutting Edge show from Everywhere Means No that actually got sort of run a lot. It's just nothing. I mean, it's just like us in a white room, you know. And then there's um, Lars Park, and then there's one for Ever... Uh, no, what am I trying to say? In Little Ways. That was kind of boring. So that's our video history, you know. We never had a real good one yet.